What's going on my friends? I'm Dustin Stelzer with Electrician U and today's Q&A day. All right, so today's trivia question, um, this is going to be something that maybe a little bit more advanced people will know, but nonetheless, here we go. The part of the generator that rectifies the generated alternating current to provide direct current output is a what? So taking the AC, making it DC, inside of a generator, what is the part called? All right, so there is a general flow to these things. We start out with the uh, less technical, then we tend to go more technical, and then we go technically nothing with some fandom and random stuff at the end. So breaking into it, let's get into the less technical. We've got Matthew Laria. Uh, this is from the Problems with the Trades 2 video. This is on a different note, but for your Q&A Friday, what's your opinion on Atlas 46 tool belt system? Um, I don't have any actual experience, like, you know, personally using Atlas uh, 46, but I've seen a lot of people that have shown a lot of interest in it. I've not come across anybody that's actually used any of their stuff either, except for some people in the comments. Um, people that use their stuff seem to be pretty like pro Atlas 46, and it seems to be kind of because of the weirdness of everything, like the vests and the weird like ways that they cross and magnetic kind of cool stuff. And it's like, seems like a lot of like military grade fabrics and things like that. Um, they have a cool factor. So there's, I mean, I definitely have my interest peaked. Um, Atlas 46, if you're seeing this, like get at me on socials or whatever, like send me a bag, I'll do a review of it. Um, I'm always looking for a tool belt to finally recommend people because every tool belt out there sucks for electricians. So um, wish I had more for you on that. Honestly, I just, I've never tried it. Um, they were the first per people that I ever saw do like a vest, though, like a tool vest. And I was like, oh, that's a really cool idea. Cause I'd always thought like, why don't we put tools up here? There's gotta be a way. Um, so we've got Keith Lewis who asks question, home user, uh, this is on the, the smart breakers video. Um, question, home user, could it be used on home with a backup generator? They're talking about whether or not you can actually use a smart breaker for a backup generator. This could shed load to protect the generator and add also like shed AC unit when hot water heater come in. So yeah, uh, the smart breakers that I'm showing, like those are for commercial applications. You could have an automatic transfer switch and ATS. Um, a lot of that functionality, the load shedding and everything is going to be functional within the programming of the ATS itself. Um, when we talk about load shedding for anybody that doesn't know what I'm talking about, load shedding is once uh, once a certain amount of load it goes beyond a certain capacity, having the ability to shut those loads off to stay under a capacity when a generator is running and uh, you don't wanna like overdrive the generator. So once, you know, say you have this big generator outside, you've lost power and you've got like a backup generator that's running your whole house and you start, too many things start ki uh, kicking on. You're like doing like drying stuff and your furnace is on and you're cooking th all your electric appliances and everything. And it gets to the point where there's way too much load on that generator it'll start kicking loads out and uh, I suppose it, I don't know with residential stuff I don't do a lot of residential installs so for residential ATS's and smart breakers I don't know that much about their load shedding but yes you could absolutely use a smart breaker um, because it's a way to remotely tell a breaker to shut off though I think that that's a little bit more of a for the, for what I was showing in that video, that's a, a very expensive proposition for those specific breakers for like a residential application. Um, so you wouldn't use those in this this case, but I suppose you could. Um, and I'm kind of curious, there, there's actually some different load centers that I've seen out there that are starting to get a little bit smarter. They're, they've got some uh, logic to them and they do have some smart breakers sort of technology in their breakers. So it's coming along, but I've actually been curious to see um, what they currently have in the residential space for that. Again, I just don't do that much of that kind of work. So 
Joey Ramirez, I'm a four year apprentice. What's the best material to study with before I take the exam? Well, funny you should ask that. You should go to electricianu.com forward slash practice hyphen tests. Link in the description below. Or Drake, just put the link on the screen. This is where you go. Um, <laughs> so I've got exams for residential wiremen, for journeymen, and for master. It's an online test environment. It's not a book that I'm going to send you, uh, which some people have gotten confused about that lately. It is a timed test environment, so you can actually take a practice exam. But the cool thing is that there's actually a printable PDF version of the same exact exam. So if you're not quite ready to go through the timed test taking environment, you can just print the PDF, print it as many times as you want, make as many copies as you want. There's an answer sheet that comes with it as well but you can sit there and practice with it. And then once you're ready to sit and take a practice exam, you can actually sit on my website, log in and take the exam yourself. Um, so hope that helps. Uh, understanding the National Electrical Code Volume 1 and Volume 2 kind of just breaks the code book up and, and goes into it uh, very much in detail. So that's stuff that I've used. DeWalt also has a book that they come out with every new code cycle um, where it's just like tons of questions. They're a little, they're a little less uh, what you're actually going to see on the test, but really what you need is practice traversing the book quickly. So, you know, uh, you're never going to need to memorize the code book. It changes every three years. It'd be fucking stupid to try to memorize it. Just a waste of, of brain power to try to do something like that. Um, but if you can go through practicing, finding answers, reading something, being like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> you know, going through uh, chapter one and being like, I think that might be in chapter three and flipping through and trying to find stuff and knowing what part you're in. And if you're if there's, you're in the wrong subsection, just being able to go through that process over and over and over and over and over for every test you take, even for your master. Like honestly, the master exam, same thing. It's just more difficult questions. It's a longer test, more calculations. There's a lot more math and stuff that you're going through. A lot of different weird kinds of services and exceptions and things. Um, but just practice getting through the book, quickly finding the answers that you're looking for and moving to the next one is the best thing that you can do in my opinion, going into that exam. Also studying like, uh, you know, calculations, studying the methodology behind like, the optional method and the standard method for calculating services, um, conduit fill, like practicing all kinds of different, well, if I'm gonna put the, you know, three two watt conductors in a number three, uh, or a three inch uh, PVC pipe, like what, how many can I fit in there? And what if I have different like conductors of different sizes instead of all the same size? Um, look at like box fill too. So if you're looking at little metal boxes and you're gonna put some plugs and switches in, knowing how many conductors and what each device is worth for the, the calculated um, volume for that box. Look at things like, um, that would be 314.16, 314.28 would be uh, like like U pulls for large junction boxes for anything that's like four out or more, um, like really, really big junction boxes where you might have like multiple rows of conduit coming in one side and then you might have some stuff leaving one side and then stuff leaving at 90 degrees and trying to figure out what size that junction box needs to be. Lots of like sizing kind of stuff is what I would start to really chew on. Um, you might want to practice some some formula type of stuff like um, a voltage drop formula, knowing power factor and efficiency, horsepower, um, how to traverse those values, how to mess with uh, KW ratings. And, and if you're given like amperage and voltage, like how you come up with KVA, uh, or you know the the uh, power and if it's three phase knowing the calculation is different from three phase and single phase anyways that's all a whole bunch of like bullshit that's like a lot of stuff that you could study but those are kind of the things that you're going to run into so the calculations are going to be very difficult and the higher licenses that you try to get the more the calculations are going to be difficult so um hope that helps uh gene ruff under the um why electrician why this is why electricians don't hide junction boxes in wall video that I did recently. A lot of people like that video. I got like 70,000 views in the first day, um, which is good for this channel. But uh, Gene Ruff says, can you use a Wago wire connect in a junction box? Absolutely. Uh, a, a Wago is a listed um, wire termination connection device. Uh, you know, like wire nuts, anything that's listed to connect wires, you can use. So. Wagos are listed, uh, just meaning that like 
a an agency has gone through them and figured out like yes we will put our listing standard on this this is definitely a good product to use um, so anything that's listed to be able to put a wire with another wire is okay to use some people uh, prefer only using wagos some per people prefer only using wire nuts um, just a matter of preference they're both made out of plastic plastic melts either way um, but it seems to be a little bit more often that you're coming across wire nuts that are melting rather than wagos sometimes wagos um, you'll lose connection on stuff, but it's, it really depends on the situation and what's being done. Um, Wagos are hard to use with stranded wire, uh, whereas you know solid wire would stab right into them. A lot of people are like anti using stab in connections for anything because here in the United States, we've had a lot of houses like in the 70s that were wired with stab in uh, receptacles so that you strip the end out, stick the stab in in the back of the receptacle. And then 30 years later, you have like rooms that stop working because the whole circuit's not connecting anymore. Um, so maybe, maybe a good thing to discuss is whether or not you're using a stab in connector as the means in which that circuit maintains its continuity through the whole circuit versus using pigtails so that you make sure that the entire circuit is joined together and then jumped out to Wago. So if anything does happen to the Wago, same thing is, is true for the device itself though. Uh, you know, like making your joint so that the entire circuit is based off of these joints and then you're running pigtails. And if the pigtail or device fails, it doesn't disconnect the rest of the circuit. Um, but I don't think like doing that with Wagos because Wagos are a bad product, that's not what I'm saying. Like Wagos are still a really good product. Tons of people use them and just as many problems could happen with uh, wire nuts and do. So um, hope that helps. All right, so let's move on. I'm gonna try to make this a little bit shorter than the normal ones that I do. Um, this is gonna be the more technical questions. Um, these are questions that uh, are probably a little bit more experienced people or just uh, questions that take a little bit of, of uh, understanding to answer. So we've got Senior Computer asks, how many amps maximum can a typical drop wire to a house handle? Yes, a typical drop wire, not an upgrade. This I don't understand. <laughs> I'm sorry. How many amps maximum can a typical drop wire? Are you talking about a service drop? Uh, and are you talking about like the utilities service, like their, their actual uh, drop or their lateral, like what they size their conductors on? Or are you talking about our service entrance conductors that attach to them at that service point and come down into the electrical meter? How many amps maximum can a typical drop wire, and you can't say typical, right? Like there is no typical drop wire. It depends on the size of the service. So for a house, for a, for like a multi-million dollar mansion neighborhood, a typical wire is probably gonna be a 400 amp service. So you're looking at much larger size conductors than you are at like, you know, a, a smaller neighborhood with smaller houses that are all rocking 200 amp services. Um, and then you might have like my neighborhood, which is in the hood, like broke ass neighborhood. Uh, where we have like 100 amp services that are, you know, like from the 60s and, you know, we have much smaller wires. So there really is no typical, um, but every, just to answer a little bit more technically, every conductor that's used has a certain amperage rating that it is rated for. So that may be a better question to, or to ask is like what, how, how are, conductor what are the maximums for what conductors so to answer that in code what you would do um, since i'm hoping you're an electrician working on wires uh, you're gonna go to 310.16 if you've got your 20 20 code book um, table 310.16 is how you figure out the size of the conductor and what ampacity that specific conductor can handle and that as electricians is how we figure out what conductors to hook up to services now the utility side when they bring their conductors in that's their own fucking deal they they have their own ways of calculating things they don't follow the nec they don't have to because this only uh governs premises wiring systems essentially some some things around utilities that are still within a premises to like offices and things like that, but they, we don't actually touch any utility uh, or distribution wiring in 
inside the NEC. So their wires, that's a whole different thing. But uh, there's also, there's a few other tables in here too that a lot of people don't, uh, don't realize. So there's three 10.17, three 10.18, and three 10.19. And these are interesting to know. Um, so if you're dealing with 86 degree Fahrenheit or 36 degree, 30 degree Celsius ambient temperature environments, you're gonna be using table three 10.15 B1 for your ambient temperature correction factors because that's also based on the same ambient temperature. So those tables go with each other, uh, 316, three 10.16, three 10.17. Now, if you're gonna use, if you're in a hotter place, like here in Texas, it's, it's over 100 degrees like all the time like 90 percent of the year so we generally will use the ambient temperature correction factors for 40 degrees celsius or 104 degrees fahrenheit which is table 310.15 b2 you can use either one they adjust the values it's just that the baseline calculations are easier uh if you're using uh b2 for hotter places and for a little bit colder places using b1 um, but 310.18 310.19 will uh work with 310.15 B2 because they're both for 40 degree environments. Now, 310.18 is, uh, and 19 kind of mirror 16 and 17. It's just that you'll notice that the temperature rating of the conductors is a lot higher. So typically it's even for uh, really high um, temperature rated conductors themselves. So you're not talking about 60 degrees Celsius insulation, 75 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees Celsius insulation. You're talking about 150, 200, 250 degrees Celsius, um, which is like hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit, 302 degrees Fahrenheit, um, stuff like that. But it's also insulation types that you're going to see like type Z, type uh, FEPB, you know, like when are you coming across stuff like that on like the average day? It's a lot more specialized. So most people just use, um, 310.15 B2 or B1, depending on where you're at and what temperatures you're around normally. Um, and then they use table 310.16 if you're wor uh, working with three or more current carrying, uh, not more than three current carrying conductors in a race wear cable. And uh, at the bottom of the chart, it also says under note one, uh, reference 310.15 B for ampacity correction factors um, when the ambient temperature is other than 30 degrees C. So this is based off of a 30 degrees C uh, environment. Anyways, uh, so that was very technical, but I hope that I got your question because that like really was a bizarre, um, a bizarrely worded question. All right, so we have Wolfgang uh, on the shorts switch loops video. If you guys haven't checked that video out, you should. There's a very brief, like short explanation of how a switch loop works and there's an animation for it and everything's really good. Um, and it like literally it's less than three minutes. Um, but he's saying, how do you do this with a three-way? How do you do like a switch loop setup if you have three ways? And that's a really good question. That's a less rare thing to come across and probably even a less rare thing for people to know how to do. Um, but if, uh, a switch loop essentially from your panel or from somewhere in the house, you have an incoming hot and neutral at, like in the ceiling of a room, let's say. And you just need to get conductors down. You don't need neutrals because switches don't need neutrals unless we're talking in code where it now it requires every switch to have a neutral just in case you have like one of these fancy new dimmers or, or lighting control systems or something like that. But just, we're not even talking about that. We're talking like theoretically, could you have a switch loop that starts in the middle of a room, you get a hot and a neutral, and you are able to run down to a three-way and another three-way in two different parts of the room. Yes, that is technically possible. You would run 12-3 to one side and 12-3 to the other side, or three different conductors to one side and three to the other side, because each device only needs three conductors, right? We've got a black screw on both devices, we have a gold screw on both devices and another gold screw on both devices. And we need a ground too, like that's rather obvious, so I'm not even considering that, but you do need to run a ground as well for both devices. But what you would do up above is you have your hot and your neutral, you leave the neutral up there because the only thing that, it, that needs the neutral is that light fixture or whatever the, you're, you're controlling. Then on your hot side, you would wire up one of the conductors to that black hot that's up in the ceiling and send it down to the black screw on your three-way. And the other two conductors, you would run down and put on the two gold screws. But up at the box, you'd leave them hang for a minute because now you have to run another uh, three conductor over to the other switch. So you would run one of the uh, conductors to the black screw and that's gonna be your leg. That's the thing that's gonna hook up to the light and turn it on. 
and then your other two travelers come up and hook up to the two travelers that you just ran from over there and that's all wires accounted for so the the the, the wire coming from the black screw on your leg side is what's going to hook up to the um, light fixture itself and the white that you left up there at the very beginning is what you're gonna hook up to the neutral for the light fixture. And that accounts for every uh, one of the rest of these. Carson Swamp. Uh, I'm from Michigan and I was wondering if you've ever seen kitchen circuits ran in 12.3 for their two kitchen circuits sharing a neutral. Yes, all the time, this house, every house that was like pre-1980. <laughs> Uh, well, not pre like there's certain eras, right? So it seemed like the late, well, mid to late 60s, most of the 70s, sometimes the 80s was all run that way. It was just a way to cut down on copper. There's all, there's been like historically copper shortages that have happened over time. One way to save cost and to like spend less wiring a place is just to run 12, three home runs and share a neutral. The problem a lot of times is that they're not evenly loaded. Sometimes people hook up, uh, two of one phase uh yeah some people will hook up two loads on the same phase that doubles the amount of current on the neutral that's another video that i should probably do just on its own um and so you had, end up having way too much current on your neutral um sometimes people will wire something in a way that if you lose a neutral it'll actually back feed and you'll run 240 volts or, or you'll run like a proportional amount through one appliance and then through another appliance so it's kind of dangerous um, you have to make sure that both of the handles shut off together that they have some kind of common handle tie or that you're using a 220 only breaker so it's a single throw but it throws double uh throws both of the the, the poles out um so there's actually like ways and codes and things that make sure for those kind of installations that it's still a safe installation. Um, but nobody does that anymore because in code, um, it makes it a lot harder nowadays to do stuff like that. And not only that, it's really just like the, you have to put arc fault breakers on almost everything now. And so if you have shared neutrals for everything, the only way to get those to work together is if you buy these like hundred dollar uh, two pole shared neutral arc fault breakers and uh, they're really ex expensive like all arc fault breakers are expensive as is but these are way more expensive so it's just kind of a pain in the ass to do it um, but a lot of times people will try to put single pole arc fault breakers on and it's like well each one of the single pole arc fault breakers needs to have a single neutral that goes into it so if you have two different shared breakers that only have one neutral you can't just put one of them in one breaker and not put one in the other breaker you can't pigtail them together they're, the the uh, breakers are going to read really weird and they're just going to trip like immediately constantly so um, it's something that like in modern wiring systems, we just don't do that anymore. Um, but it is something that you will run across definitely when you're doing like 70s eras houses, uh, 60s eras houses all day, every day. All right, we have Genju Hauman. Uh, in apartment buildings, does every apartment have a separate ground? This is on the Why We Bond video. Um, in an apartment building, that's what we call a multifamily, uh, a multifamily dwelling. So we have a whole bunch of different kind of single units in one building. Um, and he's saying, do we have to run a separate ground? I'm assuming that you're that you're asking like for bonding reasons where we would make the bond, because like everywhere that we run conductors, we have to run a ground. Uh, an equipment ground but your language we need to be a little bit more specific whether or not you're talking about an equipment grounding conductor that is run uh, with a circuit out to a uh, you know like something that we're going to subdivide into branch circuits or something like that um, if you're talking about feeders where you're running something from a main disconnect to a, a piece of equipment or another main disconnect or another panel or something like that where there's another breaker essentially that we're running between a breaker and a breaker that's a feeder um, do we run an equipment grounding conductor with that um, or are we talking about like service entrance conductors? Are you talking about a grounding electrode conductor or are you talking about an equipment grounding conductor? Um, but it's on the why we bond video. So I'm guessing they're just wondering like how, how, since in a regular residence, we would bond the service neutral and ground together. 
with the uh, grounding electrode conductor that goes down into the ground rod, we bond all those things together at the first disconnecting means for the premises. That doesn't change at all with multifamily situations. So usually with multifamily, you'll have like on a building, you'll have multiple different disconnects. Right, so you have multiple different suites, units. Uh, each one of them needs to have its own meter because it's metering the usage for only that sp specific setup. And then you've got the main disconnect for that specific setup as well. So each one of these buildings typically has its own main disconnecting means. And uh, at that main disconnecting means is typically where we would bond. But what they're saying is if there's anything upstream of that, where there's another main disconnecting means, would we, would we make our bonding point at the individual disconnects at that apartment building, or would we make it further upstream? And the answer is wherever the first disconnecting means is, right? So if you have some main override disconnect for an entire building, that is your first disconnecting means. And then wherever it goes next is subdivided, but you would have all of these objectionable current paths, all of these alternate paths that current could flow on the neutral and the ground in between all of them if you didn't do it this way. So all of that fault current needs to come back to the service and that's the main service disconnecting means. Now there are uh, different situations where you may not have a main disconnecting means that's back upstream from all of your other uh, separate disconnecting means. You may have a building that just has six different uh, disconnects that you know you can shut six different suites off. Um, and in that case, there's a couple of places like, uh, let me see, part three. If you look in grounding electrode system and grounding electrode conductor, it's going to show you the types of grounding electrodes, then it's going to show um, sizing them, conductor material. Uh, where was the multiple buildings part? Oh yeah, so 250.64D. Uh, building or structure with multiple disconnecting means in separate enclosures. If a building or structure is supplied by a service or feeder with two or more disconnecting means in separate enclosures, the grounding electrode uh, connections shall be made in accordance with 250.64 D1, D2, and D3, or D3. So the first one is a common grounding electrode conductor with taps. Uh, number two is individual grounding electrode conductors at each one of the disconnects. Um, or a common location. Usually this is talking about like exothermic welding and stuff like that. So there's a, there's some things in there that you could probably use different grounding uh, means of, of grounding electrodes. Um, but in general, the idea is to try to always stick to the first disconnecting means. The, the But if you don't have one, if you have six, like each one of those is the first disconnecting means. So a lot of times you'll go a little upstream from all of those pick a point and from that point, that's the point where you bond or we call it a lot of times stinging the neutral um, in a gutter or something before the, con the service entrance conductors or feeders jump down into all of these disconnects. You've already bonded up there at the singular point. Then all you're doing is running um, kind of taps or jumpers down and you can either uh, come from that single point and go down to a grounding electrode or you can have each disconnect. Why would you want on earth to drive this many fucking ground rods? But you could have each one of them have their own ground rod and that's okay because they all still come to a common point that is uh, not, there, there's no other uh, devices ahead of, even though that your connection is ahead of it um, and that connection goes out to all of the other loads. Hope that was not as confusing as it kind of sounded in my head as I was saying it. <laughs> if you need a little bit more explanation, that actually might be a good video to do on like how multifamily grounding works um, and bonding and all of that. All right, beard, beak, 47. My question is, I installed four remote fans, two different brands in different houses today, of which the fan would work, but the LED light would not on three of them. The three that did not work were on dimmable switches. Even after bypassing the switch, they still would not work. However, one that I installed that ran off of a single pole switch never had an issue. Do you think that the dimmable switches would have messed up the fan receiver somehow? This is largely dependent on the brand that you bought. So like it depends on what kind of receiver, if these are remote controls, uh, controlled fans and there's like a receiver with a bunch of wires and stuff, what the dip switch settings are, what their factory uh, settings are, if that light was not dimmable and you tried putting a dimmer on it. If you're trying to use a dimmer to control something that has a control module in it, 
um, and really you're only hooking a black and a, a white up to the incoming power for that module, then you're dimming everything. You know, you're, you're like essentially dimming the amount of power that's going to the entire fixture itself. I don't think like under driving it that you would have destroyed anything doing that, but that's, I mean, obviously it's not gonna work. Um, but that's why these remotes are there because the remote actually sends a signal that internally that module is the thing that's changing, that's dimming, or that's changing the, uh, the frequency um, at which that motor is able to turn. So dimmers and fan control speed uh, completely operate differently. Um, one of them is is taking a certain portion of a sine wave and is cutting a, a, an amount of that sine wave off. And it's kind of like stepping uh, what parts of the sine wave you're it's deriving its power from, and that's why the more of it that they use, the brighter that the light's gonna be. Um, and especially with LED drivers is how they work. They actually like, cut part of the sine wave off um, and they're, they're lessening the amount that that light is on. So it appears, because it flashes 60 times every second, it appears that it's a lot less light and a lot more light. That's generally how a dimmer works. But you have to control the frequency of a motor to be able to slow a motor or to speed up a motor. So it's a different device completely. You can't use dimmers to control fans. So I, I mean, I don't know that your fans are actually bad. Uh, there's a lot of electronic components inside of these things. There's a lot of inconsistencies, especially if they're like Home Depot bought, you know. Um, there's a manufacturing process that they try to get everything the same, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes, um, you know, like a, a small little change in one wrap of a conductor around, uh, you know, some kind of resistor in the board might like make that come on and make another one not come on. You know, who knows? It could be a difference in the amount of voltage. It could be a difference in uh, what other loads are on with that dimmer, how the circuits run, like there's 50 bajillion reasons why this could be. Um, if it's if it's two different brands, you can't even like, you don't have enough raw data to really process like what the problem is. But if you're saying you bypassed the switch and you just hooked it up and it still wouldn't work, um, I mean, that's probably a whole different thing. It's possible that you could have shitty fans. I've had some like really nice fans that I've installed recently um, that these people keep calling me because they've got tons of these fans. Uh, they're Minka Air fans, which Minka Air is like really nice, you know, high-end fans. But there's some of them when you go hook up, they just don't, they like, they have this kind of auto startup process when you program the remote to it. They kind of like get rock back and forth and then they start to spin. And a light, usually some of them have like a light that'll like blink and come on and go off. And that, that lets you know like, hey, we've synced the remote to the actual uh, fan. And it, a lot of them are programmed from factory and stuff, but sometimes they just don't work. Sometimes they like, and then they just shut off and stop or they hum or whatever. There's just something wrong with them. So if you got a cheaper brand, there could have just been shitty fans, honestly. Being that you have two different brands, that's the only thing that, that, that like weakens your ability to know this because if it was all the same fan, then you could be like, okay, there's something fucked up with <laughs> like three out of the four same exact fans. There's a problem here with like the wiring. You could have just wired the top of it wrong. You know, like you, who knows, man? There's a lot of different things that you could have done. You could have like put the wrong switch leg if you had 12 3 and you have a black and a red going up there you could have hooked the red up but you're hooked up to the black switch and you're like why the fuck is this switch not working there's so many things so i'm sorry that i don't have like a very exact answer i need to know more about the situation the brands of the fans um uh exactly how you hooked them up what kind of modules there are if there's a wall controller if it's remote control um because another thing too is like just the, the, the frequency, um, like how these things talk to each other through infrared uh, or radio frequency, not infrared, radio frequency. Um, there could be a problem with it trying to communicate through a remote um, or they could just be shit fans. There's a lot of different things it could be. So, um, sorry. And then we've got Dwayne Clemenson, great videos. Thanks, what do you think of the, load, the Leviton Smart Load Center? Actually, I've been thinking about reaching out to them to see if they'll send me one. Uh, I haven't got to try them. Every time I go to Home Depot, I see them. Or is it Lowe's that has them? It might be Lowe's. I don't see them often. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's, I don't know. Maybe Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, 
I know I try not to shop at Lowe's, but like I have a Home Depot and a Lowe's equidistant from each other. So it's like, fuck, if I'm going up that way and I need something, I'm going to go to Lowe's and like kick and scream every second of the time that I'm there. Um, or I'll go to Home Depot most of the other times if I have to, if I'm not already going to a supply house. Anyways, I don't know. Uh, to answer your question, I, I, I don't have an answer because I've never tried them, but they seem like a very interesting proposition. I think that every load center should be very smart, should be able to uh, have the, the philosophy of a smart breaker where it can be remotely controlled turn off turn on i think every breaker should do diagnostics for ground fault for arc fault protection both combination and series arcs um, i think they need to have the dual function capability and i think that every load center should have a brain in it that is able to graphically represent and keep historical data over time of what your electrical system is doing and track faults and record faults whether or not they were ground faults whether there were storms, lightning strikes, whether there was a difference of potential that changed all of a sudden, you know, like there's, there's so many different things, uh, like surge protection, you know, we have to install surge protectors, but knowing when surges are happening throughout the day, real time data and stuff like that, knowing if like you, t if like a big surge came in at one time, um, just seeing all of that data would help us as electricians be able to diagnose what has happened with the electrical system recently because we're able to go through and log all that data. I don't think this is anywhere near that, um, but hopefully that's the direction that they're going over the long term. So that's my thoughts about it. Uh, all right, so now we've got the random and fandom. Tiptoe quickly one, where can I sell old and new panels and transformers or should I just scrap it all? Um, I would just scrap it all. I mean, some people for like collector's items, they might want to buy some older stuff like this I got off eBay. Actually, like most of this old shit that you see, even like old lamps, capacitors, um, tubes, like all kinds of stuff I got from uh, eBay. So there is a market for it. Some people like decorating, but that's really about all you're gonna get with it. Uh, there's nobody out there that's trying to like, repurpose a lot of this old stuff. It depends on what it is though. There's some bigger stuff. There's a, wi a company called Widespread. Um, they will take like really, really huge breakers out of big switch gear and stuff like that, like 2000 amp breakers and, and um, large stuff. And they will recertify them. They'll kind of like take the guts, the insides out, test them. They might change some stuff, put new materials in and then they'll resell them because they're just so expensive. And it's such old equipment that you, you have to just repurpose this stuff. But it goes through like a rigorous testing. Um, as far as like these kind of breakers, there's already companies that make new ones. So there's really no reason that they would buy them from you because they're not gonna old, like sell all the old shit. Um, transformers, depends on how old <laughs> somebody might buy a transformer for use in their shop with a piece of equipment that they've cleared from a manufacturer to buy this used thing. But like most people, most big manufacturers are not gonna let you just use an old transformer for some new piece of equipment that they just hooked up. Um, and most of the time, most installations that you do with electrical, you can't use like used shit that's not um, at least remanufactured and certified and listed and uh, basically stamped that it has been certified by some testing means. So I would just scrap it all if I were you. Uh, interstate love song. When are you going to grow your beard back? Smiley face. Uh, I don't know. The beard has been something I've been rocking for at least a decade. Like that was my everyday carry. My face, my face is everyday carry it was a beard. Um, and for the last year, a little bit over the year, I have had a shaved face. Um, I don't know, man. I go back and forth on it sometimes. Uh, usually my answer is in the winter. Like when it starts getting cold, that's when I keep, I keep like my little fuzz thing over my face so that I'm not so cold. Uh, we'll see. Maybe once I go up to Colorado, I've got a little under two years, well, right around two years before I move up to Colorado. So maybe when I get up there, I'll, I'll be rocking the mountain man beard because I'm going to live way the fuck up in the mountains. I'm not living in some fucking smog ridden town like Denver. Denver's kind of a shithole. Um, sorry to any of you that live in Denver. It just looks like a fucking bag of assholes. And <laughs> it's like there's industrial shit everywhere. It doesn't seem like there's any zoning. You know, it's just it's just like looks like 
going through the rest of Colorado and spending a week up in the beautiful mountains and then getting to Denver, you just feel like you just fucking got cancer. You know, like it just has a, a rough feel to it. Uh, airport's kind of cool though. <laughs> Nick, Nicholas Lakova, Lakovera, uh, an electrician that cleans up after himself? No. <laughs> the, uh, that was on the uh, Don't Hide J-Boxes in Walls video. Um, Cause I talk about like having a, a um, dust cloth under me, drop cloth under me and uh, working cleanly. I hear that a lot though from builders. A lot of builders are like, bro, electricians suck. They leave little wire fucking things everywhere when they strip wires. And that's probably all they see. But if you're if you're an electrician, you realize like, dude, stripping wires when you're like when you're like stripping thousands of wires a day, those little shits get everywhere and it's so hard to take to get all of them. And if there's one little green piece of a wire sleeve, the builder's like, oh, electricians don't clean anything. It's like, bro, we vacuumed, we cleaned every surface. We licked your countertops clean and then washed them. You know, like we missed this one little thing. So electricians, I think get a bad rap for that. Um, I think plumbers are the worst, honestly. When I watch on a job site, plumbers bring their 50 gallon buckets in and they just like start fucking throwing pvc shit everywhere so every trade has to walk through a sea of their fucking couplings and pipe and everything oh that pisses me off so much um everybody's kind of messy though honestly every trade's got their version of messy um it's just the, like people in general if you try to be cleaner while you're working um you're not working over the top of all your messes you're able to work more efficiently plus you look like you know what you're fucking doing otherwise you don't you look like you don't know what you're doing or you look like a slob who doesn't give a fuck um, and so the regret of hiring somebody while watching them just be a piece of shit and like pe just make all of your stuff filthy. Oh man, that would, that would piss a lot of people off. So I understand, but, uh, come on, don't dog on electricians that much, man. We got Chris Sean from the same video from the, why, uh, this is why electricians don't hide junction box. Uh, love the video. Can, uh, can you do more service call videos? They're very helpful. Yes, I have, uh, I've already recorded probably like 15. Um, so we're slowly launching them over the next few months. Usually there are Monday videos, um, but I've been, a lot of people for a long time have been asking me for new trouble, to do troubleshooting kind of theory and, and how I test for things and how I think about trying to solve problems, which is great because right now I'm doing a lot of service work. I'm not doing any new construction. Um, well, that's not true. I have one new construction job that I'm doing that I'm filming that you guys probably won't see for a while yet because it's going to be a while before they do the trim out and all that. I guess that's it. Let's leave it at that. Very, uh, uh, tried to be a lot shorter. I don't know. It was probably still just as fucking long as normal. Um, but now we have to give you the answer to the trivia. The part of the generator that rectifies the generated alternating current to provide direct current output is a commutator. So a, uh, a generator is going to generate an alternating current. It's basically a, a spinning uh, magnetic field. And so what results from that is AC. So if you want direct current, you have to put this extra thing in called a commutator. And a commutator just essentially keeps current flowing in one direction. Um, so hope that that helped a little bit. Learn you something. Um, this is actually a really good book. If you guys are interested in learning about electrical motors, it is so thick. Um, it's got every kind of like starting, interlocking, magnetic control, uh, heating curves. It's got drive sequences, how to like um, variable speed drives, how to slow motors, bump, jog, a bunch of different like electronic speed control, switches and relays, motor selection and replacement, how to figure out what you need why you need it. There's a lot of really, really great information if you're a little bit more advanced and you're kind of interested in starting to learn about motors. Uh, Audell's Electric Motors, the all new sixth edition is the one you should get. That's all I got for today. I'll see you next Friday. Next Friday is going to be a live. Um, I think what I'm going to start doing on my lives is do like an actual live lesson. I'll get a whiteboard up here and I'll draw some stuff out. Maybe start talking about uh, things like how do you get 277 and 480? Like where do those numbers come from? Um, or how do you, what's like, how do you get 208 and 240 and um, some three phase kind of stuff? 
Uh, leave some comments below if there's things in this coming Fridays live that you would like for me to talk about. Uh, if we do like a little lesson plan or maybe I can break open some of these books and uh, talk about particle physics or electronics or whatever. I don't know. Let me know what you guys want to know. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Appreciate it. Make sure that you join the, member, the channel membership. I just added a new level of membership. It's thousand volt members. So uh, that you get my phone number. You actually get to be on a text message basis with me. So if you run into stuff out in the problem, uh, out in the field, you got problems or um, you want to know about product launches every once in a while, I just send a blast out to um, everybody that's in this, uh, this community and ask for advice or let people know about products that I'm launching or anything like that. So um, you also get all of the other stuff from all of the other channel membership tiers. Um, it's just a new thing where you get a little bit more. So check that out. Make sure you hit join, hit subscribe, hit thumbs up, like this stuff, uh, hit the little notification bell so you find out about more episodes every time that they come out. Love you crazy people. See you soon. Best music and video.